This is a video regarding uh, the case of Michael Peterson that has gained, I think, quite a bit of interest of late with documentary and uh, media coverage. Uh, blurb, just for those who aren't familiar with it, on December 9, 2001, Michael Peterson called an emergency line to report that he had just found Kathleen, his wife, unconscious in their Forest Hills neighborhood in Durham, North Carolina and suspected she had fallen down the stairs. Um, he was convicted of her murder early on. Uh, this is years ago. And then um, during the appellate process, he was able to plead guilty to manslaughter instead, um, which created no small controversy for uh, an Alfred plea for uh, many who followed the case. And what I like to do is I like to look at the first thing regarding um, the subject. And the first thing uh, is really the 911 call. That, um, to me, is, is most important. It's, uh, in a sense, it's the first interview. It's the first thing that you get to, to know about the case. I'd like to go back to the beginning of a case before so many of the complexities are uh, brought in and so many of the nuances are brought into the trial. And, and those things are all important and those things are to be examined. But as I look at a case, it wasn't a case I followed. I, I didn't see the documentary or the series. Uh, I'm just listening to the 911 call. I'm looking at the words that are used and I'm going to consider things from there. And I had done a brief analysis on this. It, it, um, it wasn't necessarily very interesting, I don't think, but um, a number of people have asked that I take a look at this. So uh, uh, here we go, we'll take a look at it. So hopefully this is up on the screen. You can hear me. Um, we have very poor internet here. Uh, I'm trying to get better internet, but we live out in the uh, in a very rural area, so sometimes it's a little bit difficult. So, uh, can everyone hear me okay? The audio okay? Good. So here we go. Michael Peterson called 911 at 2.40 a.m. on 9 December 2001. He's going to find that his wife has fallen down the stairs. We begin with the premise that we believe him. His words will guide us. Um, we have certain expectations that I think are quite reasonable. And what we're looking for is that his priority will be his wife. And he's going to ask for help for her. If he asks for help for himself, will consider the fact that he needs help, not her, unless, unless he's asking for help on how to administer first aid, CPR, etc. So we're looking for someone who is going to uh, go on instinct. This is one of the reasons I love 911 calls or, or 999 calls, is that they're showing, it's the first interview. They're showing what it's like to have a type of excited utterance where Someone is just going on adrenaline who uh, may be shocked, dismayed, upset. And the words they're choosing are being processed very quickly. Where there's a slowdown in that, and sometimes it's a pace or cadence, it can be because someone is working from uh, rehearsal where they thought ahead of time. We look for, uh, in the language, no real time elapse, unless there's an, a genuine time elapse where uh, you didn't find her or something happened. It should be no delay, though, in emergency, and there should be no delay in, like, you will know right away what my priority is. My priority is saving my wife's life. So what do I do to help her? Uh, get here for her sake. Get She needs help. That sort of thing. Just things that the brain is going to say, uh, along with shock and, oh, my God, and... Um, all the other horrors that you can possibly imagine. So the question is, does he reliably report what happened in this emergency call 
which would then lead us to say prosecution, police investigators and prosecution got it right. Uh, and has it been uh, under the influence of Hollywood that may have persuaded people otherwise? So I'm looking at the call, and, and that's all I'm looking at at this point. I've not seen the documentaries or shows or anything like that. Um, I'm just going by the words here of a typical emergency 911 call, knowing what they should look like and knowing what they look like uh, in the, a huge database. 911, Durham 911, where is your emergency? So this should give the address because I want help. He begins with a pause. Uh, and at any given point, I'm willing to dismiss something from him. But the address should be known of your home. And you should be on that type of high alert. I did wonder if he was expecting what is your emergency rather than where. But he, it comes with a pause. So I, yeah, I'm going to take note of it, wherever it shows up. Uh, 1810 Cedar Street, please. Please. Please what? What's wrong? This is a good question. What's happened? My wife had an accident. She is still breathing. Okay. I don't fault too much that we don't have her name here. Uh, but he has gone to the conclusion of the matter first. And this, this concerned me right off. My wife had an accident. It is to tell police, that's who he's speaking to, that it's not his fault or anyone else's fault. She had an accident. He doesn't tell what kind of accident. My wife fell down the stairs. My wife had an accident will indicate that a certain amount of time has passed that he knows the conclusion of the matter. Or he saw it, that she had an accident. My expectation was my wife fell down the stairs. She's bleeding. She's this, she's that. What do I do? Get here quickly for her. That sort of thing. But my wife had an accident. Doesn't tell police what kind of accident. She is still breathing. And this um, was very concerning initially. Because this is the first thing that he's saying. And the first thing he's saying is, I'm not telling you what happened to her. She had an accident. Is it a car accident? Did she fall outside? He's not telling them what kind of accident. So in 911 calls, regardless of the personality of both the caller and the operator, we look for one of two impressions. Either the caller is working to facilitate the flow of information to get help or not. Or not. And we've seen some calls, and, and they were guilty callers, who painfully avoided giving detail. And others who also were guilty callers gave so much detail that was unnecessary. But we want to hear him initially, but the first thing on his mind is say what happened to his wife. So this is the conclusion of the matter, is that what happened is not my fault. It was an accident. It wasn't intentional. When he says she is still breathing, the word still is what we call the element of time. He is telling the operator, whether he realizes it or not, that time has elapsed while he's observed the breathing. If this is all I had, I would red flag it and say, uh oh, this doesn't look good. He's gone to the conclusion 
and time has passed. I would look as an investigator for a delay in making this report. Now, I don't even know if this is true. I want to believe everything he says, but I'm not even sure this is true. It's that unusual. If he had been working on her and trying to get her uh, before calling 911, time would pass. You'd have to tell me that. Was he, was he waiting for her to expire? So the operator has to ask, well, what kind of accident? She fell down the stairs. So um, it can be an assumption that she fell down the stairs, but this is something that should not have been, had to been asked and something he should have offered immediately. So something is amiss here. She fell down the stairs. This is a strong commitment to that. Whether he pushed her or not, we don't know, because generally people will be deceptive by withholding information. But he first need to needed to classify this as an accident. And now he's going to tell us what happened. This is his priority right here. In fact, this is his initial priority. This is it. This is, this is the most important thing he can say, is she had an accident. Instead of what happened to her. And then he tells us time has passed. There is a delay someplace. She fell down the stairs. She is still breathing. He literally doubles up on the passing of time, which tells us significant time has passed before this call. And then we wait for him to ask for help for her. Please come. He's not asking for help for her. He's not asking for help for him on what he should be doing. If she's still breathing, what should he be doing? So operator asks, is she conscious? What? Is she conscious? No, she is not conscious. Please, please what? Please what? And we look at, at ingratiation where uh, someone may use very polite language to psychologically make friends or make peace with law enforcement where it's not necessary for an innocent person to do so. Some people are overly polite and, and uh, even under emergency they might use the same language, but it is something that we take notice of and we combine that notice with other things that are going on. So I have someone that wants to make sure that police know it was an accident, who's being really polite. He's not making demands. He's being polite. He's being polite. While his priority statement, the first thing out of his mouth is going to be, you can't blame me because it was an accident. How many stairs did she fall down? Okay. And this is a good question because this will now guide the operator on what type of, understanding what kind of injuries that have been caused, what first aid to administer. Is she bleeding? Where is she bleeding from? What, what? How many stairs did, stairs? How many stairs? Um, 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 just roughly how many stairs? What's the height there? Calm down, sir. Calm down. So it's difficult getting the information. No, damned 1620. I don't know. Please get somebody here right away. Please. So we go back to the politeness. We go back to a type of urgency that, that some people will naturally say, hey, this sounds contrived. Um, she fell from 20 feet. She fell, you know, whatever it may be, let us know so we can help her. And we're still waiting for him to ask for help for her or for him doing first aid. Okay, somebody's dispatching the ambulance while I'm asking you questions. Remember, I'm already concerned that he's been waiting, that he's been delaying this. Okay. 
Okay, somebody's dispatching the ambulance while I'm asking you questions. Uh, it's um, it's Forest Hills, okay? Please, please, please what? What do you want? Who needs help? Okay, so somebody else is dispatching the ambulance. Is she awake now? Um, uh, hello, hello, um, uh, and then the second call. Where's your emergency? Where are they? It's 1810 Cedar. She's not breathing. And so over the passage of time, it's no longer still. She's not breathing now. Please, please, would you hurry up? So the politeness under such an extreme circumstance is repeated. And that's why we're looking at the ingratiating factor. Don't see me as the enemy. Don't see me as a suspect. It was an accident. And I'm really a polite person. And this is where the, the brain just gives out the information that we seek. He should have been screaming at them. Tell me what to do. Where is she bleeding? What happened? These are all things that had to be asked of him that he wasn't offering. Sir, can you hear me? Sir, yes. Sir, calm down. They're on their way. Can you tell me? Sure, she's not breathing. Sir, hello, hello. So this is a very brief call. This uh, is not much information. But we're, we are able to establish, even from this, that he should be, at this point, with just this, a suspect in his wife's death. So I, I'm not a big fan of, uh, some of you know, I'm not a big fan of Hollywood. I'm not a big fan of how things are portrayed. Um, it becomes uh, something that is ratings-driven. I've commented on making a murderer before. And, uh, how that really was more a propaganda piece than anything else. And it was, I think well done in terms of manipulating emotions through music and uh, certain camera angles and avoidance of, of really any type of confrontation. And I don't have any plans to see this one, but right from the very beginning without going any further, uh, I've got indications of someone who was a guilty caller in this who should be a suspect. Now, I don't have the interview, I don't have other uh, information on it, but right from the very beginning, he has given indications that uh, he needs some form of alibi or protection to make sure it's blamed as an accident, and that significant time passed before he called 911 to be able to see her breathing and still breathing, which will sound very much like, I'm waiting for her to expire. Now, I don't know if she was at that point still breathing, uh, given his the sensitivity and the repetition and the unnecessariness of it, unless he was uh, giving first aid under the operator's direction and getting upset over the amount of time that's passing. But we don't know of anything of first aid. He didn't ask for help for her. He didn't ask for help for himself for helping her. Uh, that wasn't part of his language. It wasn't part of his priority. Yeah, I, I think, from um, what Tanya is saying, I think he knew that she had stopped breathing at a certain point. And at least that's what he gave to the operators so that, that when uh, authorities arrive, they won't see that she's still breathing. So it, it's quite um, plain in the analysis, although very short, that Police had the right suspect initially on. Now, the interviews and other issues may have uh, furthered this. I, I'm quite sure it did in the trial. He was found guilty. Um, later on, taking the Alfred plea to manslaughter affirms involvement. And so he's, he's now out and that sort of thing. But um, this is where we listen very carefully to what someone says. And even under the, the pressure of an emergency call, our language is chosen so quickly that it reveals our priorities in what it matters most to us. 
And so it's no different than a lot of the cases that we look at where someone's words, the first words that are processed are words that cause us concern. So thanks everyone for joining in and um, hopefully we'll see you for another video coming up soon.